welcome once again to Cinemaholics, the major motion podcast, where we talk about the biggest and best films coming to theaters and streaming online. From the San Francisco Bay Area, I am John Agroni, film editor for InBetweenDrafts.com. And from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he is a freelance uh, film writer. And Willow, that sandwich has taken so long. Let's do a podcast in the meantime. It's Will Ashton. Oh, man. Yeah, I was not expecting so much food in this movie. I'll, yes. I'll be front and be honest about that because I saw this movie without getting lunch because it didn't really fit into my schedule. I was you're like, I'll be fine. I bet during the microwave scene, you're like, ah, oh, man, again? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like, I love spaghetti and I was not expecting spaghetti to factor into the plot as much as it did. So I was just like, oh, man. Like, I, I, I would advise anyone, since we are in non spoiler territory, if you're going to watch this movie, get have a nice hearty bowl of spaghetti there you go um we do have a special guest uh all the way from salt lake city utah uh where you know i like to go a lot um for the, for the sundance film festival um but this person is not the sundance film festival uh he's a writer at in between drafts and a bunch of other places uh like robot eats dinosaur.com it's brogan luke bowes hey bro Hey, how's it going? Um, I am not the uh, Sundance Film Festival, unfortunately, but I do live near there. Um, yeah, I, I used to stay in Salt Lake once a year and, uh, you know, hike it over to Park City. Beautiful place. I love it. I love hanging out there. It's fun. It's the, it's the hill. The hill will get you during the uh, during the snow of the festival. So bring bring boots Mm -hmm. uh with steady traction but it's it's a nice it's a nice place when there's when there's snow pushing down the smog for those of you don't know uh sundance takes place in january and park city is like a ski resort so sometimes getting in between places is uh very very uh it's, it's treacherous stuff you know i've definitely you know questioned my like soul um trying to make that trip but uh anyway Super we're talking about the flash and we had to have bergen on because bergen you, you reviewed the flash for us on in between drafts and you had you had some choice words for that movie and i think uh you know i, I don't want to give anybody's opinion away but i think you know it's will's favorite movie of the year so far um and you know he's ready to talk about it um actually no will when i when i got out of the flash uh, a week or so ago yeah i i made the claim i went bold about it i was like this i i felt like this movie was going to do psychological damage to you as a person right. and you were very confused by this you were like what are you talking about john the Fl- you know me in dc superhero movies win them all yeah i still don't know what you mean by that <laughs> i feel like you're playing coy um yeah and, and also you were like oh well that's that's what dungeons and dragons did to me like okay now you're just i was that, i would say that one is more psychologically damaging to me than whatever you think the flash did to me you're you're more psychologically damaging to me um this is uh the latest uh, i guess it's going to be one of the last dc movies that's still kind of like a pre-james gunn kind of movie we also have blue beetle coming out we have aquaman too but the dc extended universe is kind of on its last legs i think they're they're kind of switching things around over there, aren't they? Um, so this is kind of like a, a movie that they have been wanting to do that has been in development hell for years and years and years. Um, Ezra Miller has been attached to it for a while, obviously. Uh, he was in Justice, or sorry, they were in Justice League in 2017. And uh, since then, uh, Miller has gone on just a, a worldwide crime spree um, that has really caught the world's attention. Nevertheless, uh, Miller Miller is not at large um, and is in this movie, and it's it's already uh, it's already out as we record this, and it's, it's making uh, it's making its money. Um, I, but before I even set up and, and say what this movie is about, I got I got to start with this, Brogan. I, do, have you wanted a Flash movie? I Has have. this been something for you? I. I, I'm a, listen, I'm the sort of, I mean, I want all movies to be good, but I especially want all comic book movies to be good. I, uh, I mean, behind me is my, it's, it's a little mess right now because this is about to become my, my daughter's room, but you can see like all of my comic books behind me on the wall. Um, now they're going to be your daughter's comic book. And now they're going to be my daughter. No, I'm, I'm, I, everything is going into, into boxes while I figure out uh, what to do with it because that's where her, her crib will go. But I want every, I mean, I want every movie to be good, but I want every comic book movie to be good. And the flash has never been an A-list superhero, but he's always been like near the top of the B tier. 
And so it is, it's a little weird to me that we've, that we've gone this long without a theatrical flash movie. And I mean, we had, we had some uh, like direct to video animated films. We had some television series. Um, but I, I wanted, yeah, no, I want this to be good. I wanted a good flash movie. Uh, despite, I, uh, I mean, the, a cloud of personal drama that currently hangs over their head. I think that Miller was the best part about the Justice League. Um, so I, I, I mean, I was excited for this movie when it was announced for a 2018 release date, and then it's it's kind of just been drawn on. But I always held out hope that it was going to be good, that it was going to be great, and uh, didn't really pay off. But I, I wanted it to be good. I, I'm a fan of the character. I'm a fan of what we've seen of the character prior to this, uh, prior to this movie, even in some not so great things, the flash has been a bright spot, uh, in some of the previous films for me. So I, I wanted it to be great. I wanted, I did want a flash movie. Yeah. For, for reference too. I mean, this movie was supposed to come out the same year as Aquaman. I think it was supposed to come out before Aquaman and we're now getting the Aquaman sequel five years after its first release. So that's a little bit of a snippet of what's been going on with this flash movie. And also we, we did see, we did see the Ezra Miller flash character or more of that character in the Snyder cut of uh, justice league, which will and I were kind to, right. We, yep. we decided, you know, like, yes, this maybe exists. Let's, let's, uh, let's accept it for who it is and why it's here. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, I've never seen you wear a t-shirt with like the flash lightning bolts on it. I, I've never gotten the sense that you're, you're a flash guy. Um, but I do vaguely remember, maybe, maybe I'm misremembering, you know, me, I vaguely remember you were, you were, you like to flash, right. And justice, like, even though that was a movie that, you know, hurt your soul a little bit, hurt your feelings. I feel like we were all on the same page about Ezra Miller's flash, right? Oh yeah. I mean, they were the bright spot. I thought of that movie. And I think I remember, like, as for as much as I was panning and criticizing that film, I would constantly go back to being like, uh, talking about the theatrical one, of course, being like, yeah, you know, Ezra Miller just really brings a lot of life and fun outside of like the brunch tangent and like some weird things that Josh Whedon added to that movie and that character. Like, um, I need friends. It's like, yeah, we can tell. Sure. Um, but I mean, you know, uh, controversies aside, if you can put them aside, uh, I mean, I think Ezra Miller is a tremendous actor. I mean, I've, I've really been taken with her stuff, um, going back to like after school and Your co-star. Yeah, well, I was leading up to that. Yes. But, um, after school and we need to talk about Kevin and then perks being a wildflower and getting to see them work. You know, and we become- can't, we can't dance over it. Well, Brogan needs to know that you were in perks of being a wallflower. That is uh, true. you were, you were credited as wallflower. Um, <laughs> not even Wolf Hour number two, like literally just that's uh, the title character. That's yeah. a big deal. The t- yeah, that's why we call him Will Eponymous Ashton. Uh, they should have called the extras the Wallflowers. I, now I think about it, that was a big oversight on their part. The Wallflowers should have started a band, and uh, you wouldn't be able to call yourselves the Wallflowers because I think that's taken, but it's taken, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, as far as the Flash goes, I, I mean, I. I don't really uh, have as much familiarity with the comic book character, but I always thought it was a fun personality. Um, I thought there was more room with a character like this as opposed to like Aquaman or Black Adam to make a really like fun, you know, appropriately kind of zippy movie with this character. And it's one of those things where kind of similar to Black Adam, like I think this has been in some variations of being made since like 2014. Like I think, I saw a statistic that this project, this film, was announced like around the time the CW show uh, was, you know, being announced or coming out or whatever. And now it's actually here. It's like just when that Flash show is ending after like seven or eight seasons. It's like something really ridiculous right. like that. Uh, which was a good show for about three seasons. And I would say, it look, they proved that they could do a Flash TV show. You know, they, they proved that this character had a lot of material, uh, has a rogues gallery that's pretty impressive. And actually, you know, I mean, they've been wanting to make a Flash movie, to Bergen's earlier point, since the 80s. And uh, they, they've kept coming back to it. I think, like, um, Goyer, who did, David S. Goyer, the f- 
famous for Batman v Superman, everybody's favorite comic book movie, right? Um, way before those days, uh, he was hired to do a flash movie kind of going off of, uh, Batman begins like the success of that movie, but it has just never quite stuck. I think, uh, some people blame the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy and being like, these characters have too much overlapping DNA. So like trying to do a flash movie would kind of be, it would feel a little bit too much like Spider-Man. So there's always this excuse of like, oh, you know. Peter Parker and Barry Allen have so much similarity in like their comic relief, quippiness, approaches to being superheroes and everything, red costume, that uh, they, they kept putting it off. You know, and they, de- they decided, we're, we'll, we'll wait, you know, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let Toby be done. It's not like they're going to make 12 more Spider-Man movies, right? Uh, yeah. Here we are. Well, right. that, or- yes, sir, that, original, that original Goyer Flash film uh, was originally set with Ryan Reynolds. Uh, as Before far as Green far Lantern, as, like, as far as yeah, the quippy uh, is they because G- Goyer famously behind the uh, the br- the Blade trilogy as well, uh, and after Blade Trinity, uh, which Ryan Reynolds was was also in, uh, snagged Ryan Reynolds. He was going to be the Flash. Uh, what, what could have been? It, it, why didn't they uh, have cameos of uh, those characters in this movie? But uh, oh, I shouldn't say anything else there. Um, okay, so here's here's the movie itself. Let's talk about it. So this is a, a bit over two hours. And uh, I'm going to say I, I went into this. I, I really did not know quite what the structure of this movie was going to be. I, I didn't see like uh, I, I saw like a snippet of the trailer. Um, at one point, because I think I was in the movie theater ignoring the trailer, but I did see, like, for example, the Michael Keaton thing. And I mean, I, it wouldn't have mattered if I hadn't seen that because everybody was talking about that uh, in a lead up to this movie. So uh, something that's kind of part of the marketing is that like, hey, we're going to use this Flash movie uh, to bring Michael Keaton back to the Batman 1989 role. So, OK. And the structure of this movie, though, is it's Flashpoint, uh, the comic from 2011 which is essentially, you know, don't go back into the past. It's like a cautionary tale about time travel. You know, not quite the uh, most original thing, but uh, the comic was actually pretty cool. One thing I really liked about it was, uh, and the movie actually, uh, the animated movie, was really cool because it it kind of like took uh, established like characters and really like changed them up. This movie is very different. This movie is sort of like, Oh, there's no wonder woman. There's no Aquaman. And like the original flashpoint, it's like, okay, there's wonder woman and Aquaman, but uh, they like have an affair together. And also they like are totally like badasses that are killing the entire world over uh, basically a lover's quarrel. Um, and then instead of Batman, you have, uh, the Thomas Wayne and, uh, Martha Wayne, Batman Joker dynamic. I mean, it was, it was like a really cool story of like, you change like one thing and, uh, it was sort of about the flimsiness of continuity in a time where that hadn't been fully explored. This movie is a little bit more of like a multiverse thing. And it's Ezra Miller's character, Barry Allen, wanting to go back in time to stop his mother from being killed, which is what they did in the uh, not just the Flashpoint movie, but also the Flash TV show. But it essentially becomes a Man of Steel sort of uh, redo um, where Barry Allen kind of goes into his younger self or meets his younger self and tries to prepare them for this big you know, general Zod battle that makes them doomed because there's no Superman. So that that's basically the structure here. Andy Muschietti directed the movie. Uh, John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein. Speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, those were there a couple of writers for that. Uh, Game Night is one of the ones that uh, people remember them for. Also, Spider-Man: Homecoming. Um, but I want to know what you two think about this movie. We'll start with Brogan because he he is the guest. You know, Andy does have a child, so I do. I have, I have a, I have two childs actually. Um, Will Will only has one, but he doesn't acknowledge that they exist, uh, and he he insists that it's something I make up. Um, okay, the the Clint Eastwood yeah. approach uh, yeah. to to being a father. Um, I was I was really disappointed by this by this movie, and I mean, coming in as a fan of the character, as someone who really wants great. DC movies. Um, there were some things that I really enjoyed. I think that when the film leans into its more dramatic elements, I think it is a fantastic success. Um, there's little emotional moments in there 
that I think are paid off very well, that I think do the characters a lot of justice. But it always feels like in Afterthought. And instead, we get really, really terrible special effects that get long, drawn out, uh, highlight sequences and we get comedy that uh, works so poorly that at one point Ezra Miller says to himself like hey these jokes aren't working and then they just keep going back again um, so there was I think there was a lot of promise you can see that promise in some of those scenes but as a whole it was all over the place and there's a lot of parts uh, I, I, as a whole I don't think it I don't think it worked Okay. Well, well, Ashton, you have been called the fastest podcaster alive. That is and, far from But I mean, only your girlfriends have said that. Um, but <laughs> it's early on a Saturday. Um, it's early on a Saturday. And you're already being short. <laughs> well, I do apologize uh, because earlier I said that this was your favorite movie of the year. I think I might have been overstating it a little bit. Uh, might have been cracking wise. I think it's only your second. Um but no, tell the listeners, uh, The Flash, I mean, what what is it about this movie that you expected it to be, and what did you get? I mean, that's kind of a loaded question, I guess, because, like, this movie is, uh, I mean, no real fault of its own, and also many faults of its own. Uh, I feel like I've kind of gone through the gambit before I even walked into the theater for it. Like, obviously, we talked about, like, it went through this long, like, pre-production hell, where uh, like screenwriters were coming in and out, directors were coming in and out. Ezra Miller was reportedly being very demanding. Uh, there was not a clear consensus, I guess, on uh, what the story should be. They eventually settled on Flashpoint. I think even at one point Ezra Miller was co-writing the script. And then, you know, we get this kind of delayed production. And then it gets delayed more with COVID. And then it gets delayed because of uh, Ezra Miller's personal problems and all these things. And everyone's like, Oh, it's going to be a disaster. Is it even going to come out? Is it going to go straight to HBO max now max? Like what's going to happen with this movie? Are we ever going to see Michael Keaton's Batman again? Cause the Batgirl movie also got kind of, uh, thrown, uh, into the fire. And then it's like, Oh no, we are going to get it. And not only are we going to get it, it's amazing. David Zaslav says it's one of the best superhero movies ever made. No, it is, according to him, the best superhero movie ever made. And James Gunn's also saying that. And, uh, you know, it's all cup like the no the call is coming from the house. You know, obviously all these these uh, reports were kind of coming from Warner Brothers. But then, you know, like, test screenings were apparently like through the roof. All these things were coming out. Cinema and then the premiere of CinemaCon, the reaction's like good, but a little bit more muted. Kind of what I expect. And then there's like the turn where people are like, no, this is not only this movie, not the greatest superhero movie. It's like one of the worst movies ever and like all these things. And then now I feel like there's kind of this like upturn where people are like, well, I don't know. It, it's not like the worst. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I, by the time I got in there, the internet I, can't make up its mind as usual. And like all these things are getting spoiled for me. Not even, I'm not even looking things up. People are just telling me these, uh, like on Twitter and whatnot. So literally people I, are finding you on the street and being like, excuse me, sir, sir, have you heard right. of the flash? Do you know this? Do you know who's in it? Yeah. They're just coming up to me like with their cell phone, just being like, Oh, by the way, this person's in the flash. It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I, all that is to say I went in there with, I think pretty low expectations. I was just kind of just like, I'm just going to see what this is, uh, you know, being done with it. I didn't even know if we were going to be reviewing it, like, cause uh, of how much you were kind of downplaying it and whatnot. And then I saw it and I'm like, whatever. I might've been doing that on purpose to kind of help you a little. Maybe uh, I thought it was fine. I don't know. Like I thought the like first 15 minutes were genuinely really fun. Uh, I, I feel like some people were kind of are trying to try to downplay the like hospital scene and the stuff with the babies. I thought that was really fun and inspired. Uh, downplay? Oh, I, you mean like kind of clown I, on it, or was it? You mean downplay it like kind of clown on the the yeah, baby hospital like, scene, like, or like they're like treating it like it was like a nuke the fridge kind of situation? And I think it was like no, I don't. Know. It's like fun. I mean, for some people, that's a compliment, isn't it? Sure. I thought you know baby shower fun I, I i had more fun with that sequence and like anything in ant-man the wasp Mania. um and then it goes along and then i guess it's kind of like where 
you are talking about Brogan, where it's like we get the two Ezra Millers, and it's like it's kind of confusing why the second uh, Flash Barry Allen is like so dumb. <laughs> like it's it's like dumb to the point of like inconceivability. Like that something happened in the time up where like they are like much dumber. I think it's in the text of it of like basically what makes Barry Allen very smart is after his mother is murdered, he like obsessively tries to become a genius in order to, you know, find a way to exonerate his father. So I think it's there in the text, I guess. But like to the point where it's like they go to Antarctica and and the other Barry Allen's like, why is it cold? And it's like, I mean, because he's quirky, Will. He's quirky and he's having a go of it. But no, I mean, um. All that to say, I mean, I think doing the kind of uh, Back to the Future light kind of story fits well. I think Ezra Miller, as, just as an actor, I think they carry it pretty well. Uh, I mean, I think they work generally well alongside each other outside of some of the bad jokes. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think I was with it for the first half, but I think it does suffer from the typical sort of stuff that happens with superhero movies. It's it's bloated, too many high stakes to the point where it feels like there are no real stakes uh you know just too many cameos too many like you know muddled images caused by bad cg by overworked uh computer graphic animators and uh it's just like the typical kind of stuff i feel like the hinders most bloated blockbusters like this one but overall i mean i don't know it kind of left me with a shrug i I didn't really have such strong positive or negative feelings i guess kind of considering all the baggies just come with it i i found it to be tolerable but nothing i'm excited to revisit it at any time uh, in the near future or i'll say what I, I'll, I'll say what i think real quick so because i i don't want us to put off a little more spoilery talk because i think it's it, this is an easy movie to spoil uh, to be sure um so what i'll say is i think the way i feel about this movie my, my general thought on it can be summed up by the way the movie handles iris west Iris West is played by Kiersey Clemens in this movie. And I kept wondering to myself, why is this character in this movie? What is she doing here? What is she adding to the story? Why is she here? And at the end of the movie, I was like, oh, it's only because she's Iris West. Not because the, they took a look at the character and how the character could fit into the plot and the screenplay and nothing like that. It was because it's Flash. You have to have Iris West. And that was about the thought, I think, that they put into the inclusion of her character. And that kind of sums up for me how so much of this movie is a checkbox movie. It's like, it's the Flash. So so we got to have him going back in time. We have to have, you know, the whole thing where, like, he eats tons of food. Um, he has to have a whole sequence where he time slows down. These are all decisions I think are made because they're anticipating what they think the fans want. And, uh, which yeah, I understand it's a very, it's a cynical, but it's a successful strategy for a lot of movies to anticipate what the audience wants and just give it to them. Um, that's, that's uh, supply and demand or whatever. But I think what gets lost here is that's kind of rubbing against, I think another sort of a message the, the movie is trying to get past, which is like, I do think like the last part of the movie kind of saves it from being a disaster for me. Because we, we get to a certain point where really it, it almost just sort of feels like Muschietti or who, who directed the It movies, which I, I don't really like. But um, so that was another thing. This movie kind of had going against it for me. But I did get the sense that Muschietti was like sort of, you know, pausing the movie at one point, kind of looking at us in the audience and being like, yeah, you know, this stuff is pretty lame. Um, this is some nerdy stuff over here. Um, and Instead, we're just kind of spinning our wheels. This is what it's like to direct one of these movies. It's kind of absurd, and it gives you a migraine. And then he kind of makes the movie about that. And I think that there's something really interesting there. I don't think this movie like really pulls off that message. And maybe I can elaborate more when uh, we can actually say what happens uh, in that scene. But I do think that there's like a conflict between two movies going on here. And there's the movie that I really, really hate um, that really bothers me. Like the, the just the the nature of like having Michael Keaton in this as Batman and just kind of like having a mug at the camera when you are really just sort of wasting what's so great and charismatic about Michael Keaton and uh, also making it feel like this is like a, a garbage bin for 
you know, a bunch of projects that they canceled, you know, like this, the Supergirl is played by Sasha Kaya in this. And she was supposed to be in a whole other DC thing that she was going to be introduced in. Keaton was supposed to be in Batgirl, which was already going to be coming out before this movie. And it just seems like that they were like thrown in here and kind of tossed aside uh, in a way that I found kind of just it left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, I, and I will say, uh, if, if the effects had been better, I think that maybe I would have been a little nicer to this movie with the exception of like, there are times when the effects are so bad. I mean, just bad, but in a way where I'm like, at least it is kind of matching that kind of goofy, like we are in a weird part of reality uh, kind of mode particularly the way that time travel is shown here. I thought that there was creativity. There were like glimmers of creativity here. It's like, that's okay. That's I've never seen time travel, you know, shown that way, but then I'd be like, cool movie. You, you gave, you, you gave my heart something to like, and then they would sort of do the Thor love and thunder thing where his head is like floating in space. And I'm just like, Oh, okay. Uh, I can't, I can't, we can't have it all, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in a lot of conflict with this movie. I don't think, I must, you know, find whatever about it as you are, Will. I don't, I don't know if I dislike this movie more the same uh, as Brogan. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of walking from this movie being like, I just want to move on. I want to do what this movie is saying. This movie is saying, move on. Don't live in the past. I want, I want to do that with this movie and just forget about it. Uh, quite honestly, because uh, I think that it's a, it's definitely a low point, uh, not a flashpoint for me. Um, any any other uh, non spoilery things you guys want to cover off before I, I open the door? I, I do think the effects are worth going into more more detail on because I, I had the same the first time we kind of see time travel and the effects aren't great, but I was like, oh, is this stylized? But as right. the movie went on and you see how poor the effects are across the board, uh, it really. It's sort of like I'm watching this movie on the big screen and I'm like, man, I really wish this was like on my phone or something where this wouldn't be as garish, as obvious. Uh, and there aren't really, I don't know, there aren't really bad effects artists in Hollywood. Uh, there are just overworked artists ones. with, yeah, they're overworked. They're on too tight of deadlines, too low of budgets. Um, but it is it is something where like there are several just whole sequences in this movie that remind me of like the plane landing in the ocean and air force one. Um, Oh, you went farther like, back than me. I was going to just go back to like matrix revolutions. Like I just yeah, imagine, I, you know, yeah. it's, it's, and there, there's parts of it where I, I don't even understand why there's parts of it. I don't even understand why, like they're using CG in some of these scenes. Um, like when you have, I mean, you have Michael Keaton walking down a hallway and then his character is just a really bad, like 3d render for a couple of the, seconds. The suit couldn't fit that day or something. Who knows? Like the, yeah. And then, uh, I mean, and there's bits, uh, as Ezra Miller plays two characters in this movie. Um, I thought a lot or, of that was seamless and there was parts of it that I think worked fine, which I mean, it should be because like we nailed this with parent trap 25 years ago. Um, but I thought you were going to reference uh, John Stamos in Full House. Right? No, they, they, they did a great job in that episode. There's, I'm just no, I'm there's joking. A, it was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a but there's like bits even where I don't know. There's one. There's one scene uh, that really stood out where there's there's two Barry Allens, but then one Barry Allen walks off camera, and you have Ezra Miller. Their like facial features move, and their face doesn't catch up like their their face is moving out of seek with like their eyes and their mouth and it's there's just parts in here that really stood out to me is some of the worst effects i've seen in a in a production of this scale in a very long time and that did make it so much harder to if, if it was a very pretty movie it would have been so much easier to overlook some of these uh, to overlook some of these weaknesses in the story. But I would, I would, I would at least, if I could say something to that end, because you mentioned the emotional kind of performances, like there, there were like some of those emotional beats. I, I got to shout out Mari Belverdu, you know, the legend herself, um, who I don't know the last time I saw her on the big screen. It might've been Pan's Labyrinth, but uh, obviously Itumama Tambien and stuff like she, 
for some reason, she's in this movie and she said yes, and we're lucky uh, because she kind of it's just like she's she's acting like capital A acting in this, and so I just yeah. want to say at least there's that. I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, I thought her performance was terrific, and I had no idea if she was in the movie, so I was really excited. Same, yeah. When I saw her, I was just like, "Oh, she's his. Mo- she's Barry Allen's mom. Wait, where is this going? Um, I don't know. This might be a little. Is this why Zaslav called it the greatest superhero movie of all time? And it's the mother I, of all superhero movies. Well, and I think the cast. I think the cast as a whole. I think does good when they have those moments. Uh, Verdu, she has some. She, I think, is lucky in that she has the film's strongest scenes, so that uh, she has the opportunity to showcase how fantastic of a performer she is. Um, I also, uh, Ian Lowe, who portrayed uh, the younger Ezra Miller, uh, and also the spitting image of Ezra Miller. So very uh, that was great casting. Great yeah. casting there. Uh, but I think, I think their those, film debut. Yeah. Those those two, um, I think, are given the best scenes to work with and really show off the acting chops that they have. But I mean, I think that I think that Miller, Kaye, uh, Keaton, I mean Ben Affleck, Ron Livingston, they all have moments of really great performances. Uh, and there are some really moving scenes in this film, which is which is why it frustrates me more. If it was just kind of across the board, like goofy in a way that doesn't really work, I would probably be less upset than if it was a uh, a film that just has these moments of greatness. Because yeah, you're right, uh, Verdu is fantastic, um, and I think that most of the cast. I don't. I don't think the capabilities of the actors in this film are a problem. I, I think that they all do a great, uh, I, I think they all do a great job when they're giving something to work with. All yeah. Right. For me, I guess that's why I kind of put this above something like quantum media or even maybe like fury of the gods, uh, from earlier this year, because I feel like I get a little bit more emotionally invested in this, despite the inherent flaws there in this film. Like I watch, Shazam or when I watch um uh Quantum Mania for the most part outside of like a few like you know like I like I know in Shazam like there's like that bridge sequence it's like kind of fun stuff but like emotionally I don't really connect to anything in that film. And Quantum Mania I'm just kinda just remember being bored and you know, outside of some, like some fun creature makeup uh and select scenes. But yeah, I mean like this one like you know, it, I think it does hit those emotional beats pretty well. And I think there is like one emotional climax of the film that I think is really well done, really tender and oddly just kind of like gentle for a film as bombastic as this, or like a genre that says bombastic as this. And I think for me, that's kind of what pushes this into being more tolerable than some of the others. I could see why you feel like, Oh, it makes it uh, harder to sit with because you have to contend with, you know, like stuff like that that shows you the better version of this film. But I guess for me, considering that I thought it was going to be almost entirely an onslaught of just, wonky cgi and quips and stuff like that which it is for a lot of it uh i i think i was more grateful and more accepting the film because it had those kind of moments of grace throughout so uh bef- before we open things up and uh we spoil this thing every which way uh, i do have to mention uh man the timing the fact that this is coming out um after all the production issues it's coming out a week or so after spider-man <laughs> into the spider-verse or across the spider-verse which it kind of uh, superficially a similar premise, but also like a kind of multiverse movie with actually like incredible animation. And these two movies are sort of, uh, they're kind of in conflict with one another, I think. Um, and maybe some people disagree, but when I watched Across the Spider-Verse, I was looking at a comic book movie kind of pushing against the sort of idea that like, we have to fridge characters. We have to do it. There's no choice. Um, it's it's how it's done. Like Spider-Man always has to be this, this, and this. And like, that was kind of the point of that movie. It was sort of like, you know, what if there was a way to sort of, you know, be uh, original? What if comic books were original? What if what if you know there was like a sort of meta, you know, verse um, that would allow you to kind of just sort of like question like what, what, what these superhero movies, what these comic book movies uh, are all about. 
And then you watch the flash and the flash is just sort of like, you can't do that. You got to, you got to do it the way it's always been done. And it, it, it's, it's like the spirit of this movie always comes down to, we're going to do flashpoint. We're going to do the story you already know. And I, I'm on the one hand, I do think that the way they do it is actually not bad. It's just the timing of it is like, it's so hard for me to sort of accept that premise of a story so soon after seeing it be deconstructed. Uh, So that that was a big issue for me. I think we should, uh, let's talk about it more um, in detail here. uh, And then we'll of course play the Rotten Tomatoes game. So yeah, if you haven't seen the flash, this is your chance uh, to, uh, I don't know if you want to see it, but if, if uh, if you if you don't want to uh, know what happens in this movie, we are, we are going to bring up a bunch of stuff that will probably ruin the movie for you. Who knows? Um, so that's going to start right now. Okay. Um, so so what I'm referring to specifically here is the whole second act. I really struggled with. I was kind of like, why are we doing Man of Steel? Like, wh- why 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 are why, why is General Zod here? Why why are we why? And and you kind of have this whole like thing where Barry like loses his powers, and he's trying to train up the other Barry. I'm like, okay, that's a a story. Um, you know that that's a plot. Um, and then there's this sort of like we got to get uh, a new Justice League together. I'm like, oh, okay. But I thought this was like a multiverse thing. Uh, sure, okay, f- sure, yeah, yeah. We get Keaton, we get Supergirl. There's this big fight, and I'm just like, I, when does this end? Um, and I'm like, when when are they going to do the whole thing with? Uh, they showed a, a, an evil Flash. He p- punched uh, Barry in the face. What happened with that? And then, of course, like you know, you you do see it coming. Like you you kind of if you've watched a movie, you would be like, okay, I I kind of see what's happening here. Sure enough, the whole idea is that the Flash keeps going back to that time and trying to like change everything and then becomes of course like this hollow monster thing and i don't think it's executed particularly well a lot of the construction of that doesn't really make sense like the time loop of it but whatever um we do get at least a message which is you know like you can obsessively like ruin your future by obsessively living in the past um to that end, though, I mean, am, am I alone on this? I broke it. Did this wor- whole thing work for you? I mean, did, I, I assume you st- stood up and cheered when you saw Nicolas Cage, your I, guy. I, uh, I think it is absolutely hilarious how much of like the current DC pop culture currently lives in a Nicolas Cage Superman movie that never happened. Uh, because this is now, what, the second, third time Nicolas Cage has appeared in reference to this movie that he's never, that he was never in. It was never made. Um, so I do, I think it's, I think it's funny. I, uh, I was going to say, is the first one the Teen Titans film? Yeah, the Teen Titans go, Teen Titans go to the movies, which is unironically one of the best DC films of all time. Um, but I remember that movie had one good scene that I liked. Oh man, I liked I I am I am an ardent defender of of that movie. I know a lot of people are hard on Teen Titans Go for not being the original Teen Titans animated series. Um which I uh, I think the the Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans sequel to the Teen Titans Go to the movies got I think uh, addressed uh in a pretty fun way. But it is uh, I there's a very like you said, there's a good message there about, you know, obsessing with the past, destroying your future. And I wish that we had been able to just really sit in that. And I wish we had this, uh, the younger uh, Barry Allen that uh, Ezra Miller plays, instead of just being that kind of goofy character, had had more of an, an arc uh, of kind of coming to uh, deal with this responsibility as opposed to just this 11th hour turn into suddenly being a very serious character. Um, and then uh, we get distra- we get all of these cameos. I mean, we get Nicolas Cage, uh, which I would be very interested to know if he was ever like actually on set or if they just like made his face. Um because all of the, I, I've talked about the special effects in this movie. That whole sequence, I think, is one of the the most obvious parts. Because we get Nicolas Cage, which I think is fun. Fighting a giant spider, uh, which is like, it, that's a fun little reference to 
Uh, a fun little reference to the the Superman Lives movie that didn't exist. Um, but then we get, uh, I mean, they bring back Christopher Reeve, which is a big, you know, he's a very significant figure, if not one of the most significant figures in DC's history on the big screen. And they, they bring him back and it looks, uh, it looks like a bad uh, deep fake. Um, and so we, we get all of these, we, we get all of these cameos and they don't really add anything to that climax. They don't really add anything to the, that message. So I, I mean, as, as, as lovely as it is to see Nicolas Cage as a long haired Superman fighting a giant spider. Why? And, and it, you talked about this being a, being a checklist movie. Uh, but it gets to the point where it's not even like, oh, well, this is a Flash movie, so it has to do this. It's like, well, this is a DC movie, so let's reference everything DC has ever done. And I, I think that sort of fan service is, is short-sighted. I don't think it's necessarily... Uh, I, I know that there will be people that are, are very excited, but I don't think it's going to excite as many people as they're hoping for. Um, so that that whole that whole climax, I did appreciate the fun little film reel looking uh, way that they approach these alternate universes. But that was that that was the end of my uh, interest in how they handled that. Yeah, I mean, well, oh, yeah, go ahead. Let's see. Um, I mean, I knew about like Christopher Reeve and a lot of the cameos going into it being like, you know, like CG I'd in probably, I don't even know if they even got, I would hope they got at least at the very least the permission of the, the family or the estate before they did that. But I mean, I will say because of that, I feel like I was less insulted than I was for like Ghostbusters where I think I wasn't as aware of that. And so when I saw that, I remember being pretty genuinely angry about how they were like using someone's um, likeness, you know, posthumously and in this way that felt very cheap and manipulative. Though I think that one, you could maybe, maybe argue they were like trying to have some good intention there, but it felt very, uh, you know, cynical to me. Uh, this one, as Brogan was mentioning, I feel like it is pretty unnecessary. So when you get like, not only Christopher Reeve, but George Reeve, who, yeah. I mean, that's the one where I think, like, you know, knowing his life. I mean, it's also very bizarre to me that we have a new uh, Flash movie that has both George Reeve and Ben Affleck, considering Hollywoodland, um, which I remember being pretty good. I, I, I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but I, I, I would definitely say if anyone doesn't know about George Lee, uh, George Reeve's life, I mean, watch that movie. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that one was just the one where it's like knowing his hardships, knowing how much of a toll playing Superman played in his life and his, uh, his like kind of tragic death. I mean, just that one, like kind of was just like, what, what are we doing here? Like, what yeah. is, um, but yeah, I mean, outside of that, I mean, I, I wish, um, they had just gone kind of more into like the Nicholas cage, like what if sort of scenario? Cause I felt like that's fun. Like, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I'm assuming they, they got the okay from Nicholas cage. And it's like, yeah, like let's have like these like lost, you know, casting things. Like obviously the Nicholas cage one's the most legendary, but, yeah, I mean, there's, I'm sure there are tons, and, like, you know, it, it would be, like, a fun little Easter egg. Like, I, even if, like, fans didn't know, like, oh, like, this person was attached to this project or whatever, you could just have, like, fun little, like, celebrity cameos pop up there. Yeah, I just don't... I think having the the likeness of these uh, deceased celebrities, and especially, like I said, George Reeve, where it's, like, a pretty tragic story, um, yeah, that that didn't sit well with me at all. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think otherwise, I... I think that idea is fine it, but i agree with brogan and, and the scheme thing is just mostly unnecessary and I, I felt like it took away from the movie more than added anything outside of the nicholas cage fun little bit there it reminded me of the uh space jam new legacy sort of planet things you know like the way that they were and, and i bring that especially to point out i don't just mean checkbox movie in terms of like here's here's the checklist it's like it's almost like the instructions you're putting into the algorithm, which, you know, 
Space Jam New Legacy was all about that, right? And they reportedly did use like, you know, machine learning AI to do the deep fakes. And I just, I think we're seeing the sort of results of that, (laughs) that like, that's not art, you know, and, and, you can use it, I think, uh, as a tool to sort of make things more possible the way you use computers in general. But I do think that we are like moving toward an era where like these kind of deep fake things, I mean, they just, they're so obsessed with the past. They're so obsessed with it in a way that, uh, yeah, it is pretty gaudy, I think. Um, so I, I don't honestly know how this movie is going to hold up over the years. I'm kind of just ready for them to, it feels like these are obligation movies, Um, there's almost something kind of exciting about that in the sense that you can go into this movie, not being like, well, you know, I'm watching, you know, Ant-Man quantum mania because I know I'm going to get like 10 other MCU movies after this that, and I got to watch this one for that. This movie is a bit more contained. You can kind of just watch it. Uh, but on the other side of that, you, you do kind of, it does sort of demand a lot of knowledge about comic book movies, um, across eras, uh, in order to get all of its references. So yeah. I, I definitely, I don't like this type of film storytelling and it, it's almost sort of like we're way past the point of superhero fatigue. We're kind of at the point of like, uh, just, just kind of spinning our wheels and it, it's like past the point of exhaustion where I feel like we're running on empty in terms of, you know, what these movies are supposed to be, what they can be and, and why they exist. And, you know, what, what, are, who's the kid who's watching this movie and being like, I can be a hero. I can, you know, like really see like the whole point of like that escapism and everything. I don't feel like I'm watching this movie and escaping anywhere. I just kind of think that I'm like, uh, you know, riding the same ride at a uh, Disneyland, but I'm at the point where I can see all the animato- animatronics are like breaking down and then I'm just, the illusion is, is beyond cracked. Um, but yeah. Uh, meanwhile, you know, you have other, you do have other movies. You have Spider-Man and across the spider verse, which I think just, uh, is such a home run by comparison. Uh, but they can't all be space mountain, I guess um, that that's the end of my Disneyland, uh, metaphor. Okay. No, I, I do think you make a great point with talking about it. It's, it's like instructions. It's like you bought a desk at Ikea and now the little stick figure guy is going to walk you through in a couple of, in a couple of easy photos how to build how to build your desk um and i think superhero fatigue i i don't think it's necessarily like a real fatigue because when these movies are great people show up and people have a great time i don't i haven't heard a single person uh mention across the spider verse in the sense of oh superhero movies like uh when these movies are great people will love them and people will show up. I, but I, I think when you start to have studios that start to churn these out, that have a production line, or at least that mentality, I mean, because if they had a production line, uh, if they then this movie would have come out in 2018, like it was originally supposed to. Um, but when you have, uh, when, you, when you have these movies that feel like they're just trying to give you exactly uh, what you want based on some sort of formula. Uh, yeah, that is tiring. Uh, real quick, I mean, I am glad you brought up Disneyland because I feel like this is sort of like the Hall of Presidents for Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you, like, uh, you go through and it's like, hi, I'm Michael Keaton and I played Batman in the 80s. And then I- <laughs> just kind of have the robot kind of just like... Right. The Hall of it Batmans. Is, yeah. Yeah, the Hall of Batmans. Yeah, uh, the Batman. Uh, I do, do we want to yeah. talk about that that very last cameo they do right before the oh, credits yeah. drop? The, the George Clooney thing. The George Clooney. George Clooney is here. Uh, I thought that was neat. I thought that was fun. That was the one cameo that really worked for me. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the film's goofy jokes, uh, that one. I, I don't know. That one felt like it wasn't trying to impress me. It was just trying to give me a good time. I agree with that. Um, I felt a little weird about that. And then there's a post credit scene where Flash is like, yeah, no, this is Batman now. Uh, talking to Aquaman because we have to know that Aquaman's the same so we can still get his movie. That was pointless. Uh, don't but, get, stay for the credits. It's, yeah, useless. Yeah, but uh, I appreciate the George Clooney cameo. Uh, of all, there's a lot of cameos in this movie. I don't think that most of them worked. 
Um, I think Keaton and Kaya f- were fine, but they're both here to set up movies that we're never going to see. Um, but I, George Clooney popping up at the end there, I had a lot of fun with. On that note, I forgot to mention this. I do think the movie would have been maybe 100% better if instead of Ezra Miller in both roles as old and young Barry Allen, uh, if, if it had been Grant Gustin in that role and they had more fun with it, that I think would have made this movie just like really, really work. I even, I, I mentioned I really was impressed by Ian Lowe as young Barry Allen. I almost would have, uh, I almost would have appreciated seeing him uh, playing. Oh, like Kid Flash? Yeah, I almost would have, I almost would have enjoyed seeing him as the other Flash for the full movie. All right, well, it's your turn to be like, who do you think, oh, you think it would have been Maribel Vardieu should have played the young? <laughs> I mean, yeah, if we want to make an art film, but <laughs> yeah, we want to make cinema, I guess. Yeah. yeah if we, if we, uh, but th- that's not what they're going for here. Bring in I mean, Diego was, Luna. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess for me, what I guess I do find weirdly kind of more forgiving about this movie is that I, I feel like Ezra Miller's, uh, appreciation for this character and, and just like general enthusiasm, uh, of playing these two parts is mostly palpable. Again, I think it relies on it too much because this movie's so long. There are just too many sequences of them, you know, going back and forth. But if they had kind of truncated that and kind of focused it a little bit more, I think that I don't know. I mean, it's I I, I think they I thought like you said before, John, that that was a pretty seamless effect, and uh, for the most part, and I, I I think you know Miller's talented enough to kind of play off themselves, so. Yeah, I, I didn't really mind that. But yeah, I mean, there is more room for, for play there, to be sure, if you wanted to kind of play it up with the casting. Uh, and it was nice to see George Clooney on the big screen again for, like, the first time. I, I mean, for me, at least, I think it's been, like, seven years since uh, i seen him on the big screen in Hail Caesar. So it was nice to see him on the big screen for Hail a little bit. Caesar? He hasn't been on the big screen since then? Are you but, sure? Uh, that's what I'm saying. He, he did, like, Money Monster. And oh, yeah, I, d- I saw that. Take it to paradise. I just didn't see those movies. You you have just been avoiding him, and whatever's going on between you two, you need to settle it. I settle saw, your differences. I saw Midnight Sky. I'm one of the few, but not in theaters. Um, well, I didn't have a chance. It was COVID. Okay, you're, now you're yelling. I think that's our cue. Um, let's go to the Rotten Tomatoes game. Um, okay, 282 reviews counted on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Will Ashen, uh, you get the first guess. Um, the flash, what do you think? What do you think the critic score is? Um, it's gotta be somewhere in the middle ish. Um, I think, I don't know. I think critics are probably going to be a little bit more favorable in this movie than, than I think, um, uh, you know, maybe some general audiences are, or, you know, I, I, I think there's fatigue, but there's enough here that they might just be kind of like, you know, like me, like kind of whatever. Uh, I mean, obviously there's the blow of like the cinema school or the uh, cinema con and like uh, Zazoff kind of overhyping it. But there is also like the stir views that came out of cinema con that were mostly pretty positive. So I'm going to say like 64%. So many qualifiers for that one. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Bergen. Uh, what, what about you? What's your guess? Oh man. I, <sighs> I, I think that I think it's going to go down, but I think there's a lot of that early hype. Uh, I think is still going to reflect in that in that rating because there was a there was a lot of hype for this film early on. Uh, I'm going to say a little higher. I'm going to say like 66, 67, 67. Well, we should say the, the score used to be pretty high. I, th- I, I was seeing it uh, not high, high, but it was in the 70s at one point and it has gone down. Um, it's definitely, at, I think the lowest it's been so far and it is 67. Uh, there you go, Bergen. Uh, so Will, he's, he's stepping into your territory. Better watch out. Pretty um, amazing. Bergen, you get the next first guess. All Audience right. score. We have a thousand plus verified ratings. Uh, Will's going to have the advantage cause he knows the cinema score, but, uh, let's see what you can do. Um, um I, I think, uh, Ooh, I think the audience score is going to be higher. Um, part of that is that hype, but there's also a lot of people who, I mean, there's a lot of people who are just going to be so excited for the flash to get his own movie, even if there's, uh, I, so I, I want to say, uh, 80, uh, 84 this time. 
Broken guess is 84. Well, Ashton, once you're a guess, um, I know you like to pride yourself on being a man of the people, having your finger on the pulse. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be weird because I think it's going to be higher than the critic score, but like low by audience score standards for superhero movies. So I feel like it's going to be like 75%. No, you're, you're definitely, you have the right thinking. Uh, but once again, Brogan, Brogan's definitely closer. Bro, Brogan's hanging out with the people. He was in the theater uh, ask, talking to people. And uh, Will, you left too early. It's uh, 85%. So, All right. But so far, Brogan's cleaning your clock. Um, but sure. this is the part where I get to step in and try to save you, you know, with Cinema Score. Uh, you know what it is. Um, so, yeah, Will, which, which of us guesses first? You get to, you, you're running the, the, running the game. You're stepping into the, the host chair. What's up? Uh, I feel like since. Uh... Brogan's a guess. You should guess first. Bias. Okay, cinema score. I'm torn on this one because this is one that I see uh, being a bit more divided. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say probably a minus. I think people are gonna lean positive on this one, even if I don't understand it. Mm, interesting. All right. What do you think, Joe? I think this is a B. If I ever saw one, um, I think that it's. Uh, I think people are gonna be annoyed with the length because it's two and a half hours, and I do think that people are gonna stay for that post credit scene and be like, "That's it." Um, so yeah, I, and I think a B is still like, it's, I don't even know if that's decent necessarily, but like I was at B plus until I saw that, like that dampened audience score. It's kind of making me think it's, uh, yeah, I'm going plain B, B John, for Barry. Yeah. B for Barry. Um, John, I don't know how you do it. That was exactly correct. I was just in Vegas. I know, I know what's going on over there. I've been on the scene. You're on the ground. Uh, you, you. <laughs> B for Brogan. Uh, we'll finish out with Letterboxd. I didn't even think about uh, if they had done, since you know we were talking about uh, potential casting, if they had just gone ahead and had uh, the other Barry be Bill Hader. All right, so uh, 70,000 watches on Letterboxd so far. Uh, what do we think of this average rating, Brogan? Take us home. Uh, I think Letterboxd, I, uh, I, I think Letterboxd is going to be right in the middle. I'm going to guess 3.0 for a yeah, flash yeah. on Letterboxd. 3.0 is Brogan's guess. Uh, Will Ashton, what do you got? Uh, I feel like I say this number a lot, but it's just the one I feel it's going to fit here as well. I'm going to say 3.2. Ooh, it is 3.2 exactly. Ooh. Uh, that's tough, Brogan. Will, Will is pretty good with the letterbox score. I feel like we need a tiebreaker. This is Metacritic? Pretty... Metacritic? Yeah. I mean, if you've never done Metacritic before. We've done Ooh. Metacritic before. We have? I guess I, I blocked it out because I, I usually do that with my memories when it comes to the show. Um, and, and you, um, okay. Flash Metacritic. I have it up here now. Uh, what do you, I, okay. Uh, we'll start with, uh, will this time. Will, what's your guess? I feel like every Metacritic score is like 54. So that's my guess. Okay. Brogan. I was going to say 56. I feel like, I feel like they tend to run like 10 points lower than Rotten Tomatoes usually. Ooh. Well, Brogan is dead on with 56. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, uh, Will, this is this is your your origin story. You know, this this is something that's going to, like, deepen in your craw for a long time. The way that Brogan showed you up, uh, think, laughed you in the marketplace of ideas. Yeah, I think it's fair to say I'm simply not up to speed. I, I think it's fair <laughs> to say that you liked the movie more than me. So, therefore, you you, you win. You're going to have a better... Sure. You have a better time. My my whole approach to this is being like most people think I'm wrong. So No, I think I think the general consensus is leaning more towards towards you than me. We were talking uh last night, uh friend of the podcast, Mike Overholst, was ripping this movie, uh a new one in the, the group chat we have for Mad Men Men, available wherever you get podcasts. Um so I, I Except in Spain for some reason. I'm joking. It's available in Spain. All right. You know, well, friends of the podcast, real quick. Uh, I feel like this movie. So, back like a decade ago, uh, next week's going to be the 10 year anniversary. Matt directed a movie when he was like at the end of high school called Warped. It's available on YouTube. You can find it. It has weirdly a very similar plot to this movie. <laughs> what? When uh, Matt goes back in time or. Yeah, well, he was Back to the Future is his favorite film, and he uh, is like trying to go back in time to like help himself 
prevents i i don't want to spoil it i'm a credited producer on it uh <laughs> you're being a bit of a zaslav right now you're kind of like, <laughs> I, honestly this is the best yeah. movie matt's ever made <laughs> he it's his one and only movie he's directed thus far so uh if you want to watch it it's on youtube check is it, it out. on his imdb uh should i don't be, know right? it should be it's on letterbox um so next week uh, so we do have Elemental. Um, I don't know if that's going to be coming out before this as a bonus or how we're going to split it up. Uh, but we're also talking Elemental this week. Our Asteroid City review is already out. Um, the only other movie coming out this week that we have been talking about talking about is The Blackening, which uh, Mike uh, watched and reviewed for us at In Between Drafts and highly recommended it. And uh, I, I don't know when, uh, when or if I'm going to see this one this coming week. Will, uh, do you plan on seeing The Blackening? I want to. I don't know when I'll get a chance to, but I've heard it's good. Yeah, same. Because um, next week, we do have No Hard Feelings coming out. Um, yeah. So that's going to be the, the J-Law, Jennifer Lawrence uh, comedy, raunchy comedy. She's back. And uh, uh, Is that what we're doing or are we doing Past Lives? Well, uh, that's what I was going to mention next is that uh, there is Past Lives, which uh, is going to be hit in Pittsburgh finally. Uh, and so I do want to talk about that movie with you. So we have, we have a couple options. We have a, a couple movies to get to here. And uh, Brogan, I know you're going to see Mad Heidi, the Swiss Plotation. Uh, are you already watched it? I am. No, it's actually on my list of. Uh, I'm going to be watching it this weekend. Um, I heard no, it it's, here's rules. why it's delayed is because I made a joke to you uh, about doing a list of uh, pitches for Lion King spinoffs, and then I thought about it, and I'm like, I have to actually do that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm almost finished writing that. You'll get to you'll get to see it soon, and then I'll be watching. For those of you who, for those of you who don't know, Brogan writes um, some of the best articles in between drafts has ever seen um, in our like seven eight month history. Uh, <laughs> so you can you can definitely find those. We'll we'll of course link out to your Twitter and everything and perfect and uh, people can find all your good stuff. Uh, but Brogan, thank you for coming on to the show, lending your flash knowledge and what have you. Um, is there anything you do want to plug before we uh, we say goodbye? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can find me, uh, online robot eats dinosaur.com, uh, robot eats dino on social media because character limits are a thing. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate getting to talk movies with you guys. So yes, good talking to you. Enjoyable time. If there ever was one. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see you all in the next one. Uh, from the internet, California, I'm John Negroni. From the internet, Pennsylvania. I'm Wash. See you next Um, time. Hey. Oh, Sorry. Sorry, Brogan. Oh, you know, I, didn't, I don't know. I don't know. It's so, hi, I'm Brogan. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. See you next time.